because the very end of your Old Testament is Malachi and chapter number 3. Malachi 3. And when you found Malachi, which is hard to find sometimes, would you say amen? amen. Okay. Malachi 3. I heard about a black preacher who had a very vocal congregation. You know how uh, uh, those churches can be sometimes. A very vocal congregation, also known as the congregation of every preacher's dream. You want to get some feedback, you know, and uh, Baptists are like, no, we're too holy for that. But he preached to them, and they preached right back. Weren't even sure sometimes who was in charge of the service. And by the way, you can be vocal here. It's like saying sick them to a dog to say amen or preach it or whatever. That's fine. Well, he got the congregation going one day. He said, if the church is going to grow, we're going to have to learn to crawl. And they said, let her crawl, preacher, let her crawl. And he said, but if the church is going to grow, we're going to then have to learn how to walk. And they said, let her walk, preacher, let her walk. He said, oh, to really grow, the church is going to have to learn how to run. And they said, let her run, preacher, let her run. And he had him in a frenzy, as he said, and then it's time for the church to fly. And they said, let her fly, let her fly. And he said, to do all this, it's going to take a whole lot of money. And they said, let her crawl, preacher, <laughs> let her crawl. God is interested in the subject of money. Not because he needs money, because he certainly does not, <laughs> but because we need it and because it's so closely tied to the heart of man. Since you are important to God, your money is important to God. God is interested in how we secure our money that we do it in the right way, how we secure it, and how we spend it, and how we save it, and fourthly, how we share it. God is interested in money. And immediately some people hear the subject and say, oh, don't talk about money, preacher. Talk about something spiritual. I came to church to hear about something spiritual, not to hear about money. And that kind of statement shows a real lack of biblical knowledge because... You can write it down in your bulletin today. Nothing is more spiritual than how you handle your money. The Bible says, Jesus said, that it's the supreme test of where our heart is. That's Matthew 6 and verse 21, where Jesus said, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. He connects a straight line between our heart and and our wallet, just like you've seen those rednecks before who have their wallet chained to their belt loop or whatever, you're not going to pickpocket me. Really, the chain is to our heart, Jesus says. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, Jesus wants me to be a preacher of the gospel. I want to be all about the gospel, the good news. The cross that we sang so much about this morning. The choir and the congregation sang about it. And we had a picture of the, the cross up. I want to be about Calvary, which covers it all. We need to be a church that's about heaven and about hell, which is very real. Preaching about salvation and preaching about the heart, which is so tied to our money. The great Adrian Rogers... Preacher Adrian Rogers said years ago, a faith that hasn't reached your wallet probably has not reached your heart. I know in my town in Illinois where I pastored for 14 years, there was a church and their slogan of their church, I mean, they were all about money. I've, here I have waited over a year to even talk about the subject of, of money. They were about it all the time, so much so that their slogan was, you can leave your wallet at home. Sounds catchy, right? Here's a church that's not going to talk about money or whatever. Well, I guarantee you once people joined and were around and there was things to pay for, they were going to need that at some point. Well, I feel like I should apologize for waiting over a year to come to these important truths because how could Jesus Christ be Lord without being Lord over all, including our money? 
that which is so intrinsically tied to the very essence of who we are. Some say, you shouldn't preach on money. Now wait just a minute. The Bible says the love of money is the, what, say it with me, root of all evil. This is a major, major statement about money. So there's nothing more spiritual that we can talk about than our attitude toward money. Ecclesiastes 10.19 says, Money answereth all things. These are broad statements. But I'll be the first to admit that it's a little bit uncomfortable. A little bit of an uncomfortable subject. I mean, it is for me. Preachers hate to talk about it because it looks self-serving and you know there's somebody sitting there saying, Oh, look who's trying to put air conditioning in his doghouse. Right. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, if it's uncomfortable for me, it's probably uncomfortable for some here. But if that's true, I just wonder if maybe we would not have cared for the preaching of the Lord Jesus. Because when he walked on the earth, he gave 36 parables. And 16 of them were about our attitude toward money. Maybe we wouldn't have, maybe we would have told Jesus, let her crawl, let her crawl. <laughs> maybe we wouldn't have cared for him either. In the Bible, there are about 500 verses on the subject of faith, about 500 verses on the subject of prayer, and over 2,000 verses on the subject of our attitude toward money. You remember when Jesus told the story of the widow given her two mites. The Pharisees were given their big, large offerings. Look at me. The little lady gave her small offering. And that whole uh, tale, that whole true story has to do with our attitude toward money. Now here's a question for you. If God's not interested in money, then why include that story in His Word? The unjust steward in Luke 16, at the end of it, Jesus said, If you've not been faithful with your money, who do you expect to commit to you the true riches? Which we all admit, there's more important subjects than that. The true riches. But he said, if you don't conquer square one, how are we going to move on? He said, there's no skipping steps. Now, if God's not interested in money, why include that story in His Word? The rich young ruler came to Jesus, asked what he had to do to be his follower. And what did Jesus say? Sell everything you have and give it away and come and follow me. But he couldn't do it. He went away sorrowful. Why? The Bible says because he didn't own his possessions. His possessions owned him. Now, when I was growing up as a kid in the Midwest, my mom used fly paper. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say fly paper, right? In ribbons, it would hang from the ceiling, real sticky. Usually it's red, right? I thought it was Christmas. <laughs> She'd hang it up, you know. You remember those old stencil things that you'd hang? Uh, she told me not to touch them, right? Why? Because it had on its surface this sweet, honey-like substance, which is very sticky. And it was a very simple principle, fly paper was. The fly approaches saying, I want the honey, want the honey, want the honey. And he lands on the paper and he can taste it. And he says, I got the honey, I got the honey, I got the honey. And then the fly paper says, I got the fly, I got the fly, I got the fly. Many people today run around saying, I want the money, I want the money, I want the money. And before they know it, the money has got them. That was the tale of the rich young ruler. His possessions owned him. Jesus wasn't telling all of us to sell everything we had, but he was getting to the heart of that man's problem, which was his heart was all about it, his own money. But if God's not interested in money, why did he put that in his word? And we could go through over 2,000 verses. We're on the same page, though. Clearly, God is interested in our money. And I'll tell you someone else who's interested in your money. Satan is. The devil himself. It is his desire to keep us under a curse in bondage. And the best way that he can do that is to affect our attitude toward money in a negative way. So God's interested in our money. Satan's interested in our money. And there's one more person. And you say, yeah, I know. You, preacher. <laughs> no, that wasn't the third person. You are 
You're interested in your money. That's the third and final person. Um, now, some of you are looking at me all holy like Mother Teresa, like, no, I don't care at all. Listen, you know it, you are. We all are. Now, let me tell you how it goes in some churches these days. The one I told you about back in Illinois is one of these, and there's many more that I've heard of these days doing it this way. They hold their actual church people accountable to tithe. When I say accountable, I mean they require proof. Show me your income. We'll do the math, and we'll check out the books and make sure that you're walking in obedience. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? That's wrong. I don't believe in that. And yet, here's the point of this story. Studies done in such churches have revealed some startling statistics. Even with that kind of, that kind of pressure put on people, those churches average between 3 and 7% given. Now somebody remind us what the word tithe means. Tithe means tenth, right? Because it's the 10%. So even there, trying to lord over God's heritage in the way that some of those churches do, being all about money, still not getting there. Now, when I first became an assistant pastor, I was under a man named Brother Steve, and he joked with me and said, now, bring your car down to the church. I've got a magnetic sign to put on the side so you can advertise everywhere you go, Westwood Baptist Church, home of the 5% tithe. <laughs> he was just kidding. 5%, 10% is what you're saying if you call something a 5% tithe, and yet it's no joke to some of God's people. Yeah, that's what I get. Honestly, here at First Baptist, it's hard to imagine that we are less than 10%, uh, as good as the offerings have been. God has blessed us. This message is not about our account. This really is about you. Um, but obedience is not about a church average either. You know, some people give over and above. It's about what I give myself. So the word tithe literally means tenth, and it's in our text we'll come to here in a moment. The tithe is God's perfect plan. Perfect plan. The wisdom of God planned for us a method of giving which is completely fair and equal, equal for all who will obey, no matter what you make. In other words, no one can say, I would tithe, but I can't afford it. Because in God's perfect plan, the less you make, the less you owe. It is the perfect plan, right? So we come to Malachi chapter 3 and look at verse 7 with me, please. You're probably just a page before your New Testament. Malachi 3 and verse 7 puts it this way. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances. God says, you're not walking in my ways, and have not kept them. Return unto me, he says, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But she said, wherein shall we return? And the next verse says, your tithes and offerings. But in verse 7, notice, we don't give to God, we return. There's the key word. We return to Him, for He owns it all anyway. There are three groups in any church, and this one's no exception. Three groups in this room right now. There's a group that's going to say, Hey, don't talk about my money. It's all mine. I worked for it. I earned it. I deserve it. I do what I want to with it. It's all mine. That's group number one. Group number two says... The tithe belongs to God. I will always tithe and give Him 10%, but the rest, the other 90%, is mine. Don't talk to me about that. I'll do what I want. And then there's the third group that recognizes biblically it all belongs to God. The 10%, the 90%, 100% of it. And I return to Him. And I want to be a good steward of that portion that He allows me to keep. You know, if you think about it, there's a big radical difference between those first two groups and the third biblical group. Because these first two say, basically, I'm the owner, and I share with God if I want to. And this group says, God's the owner, and look at what He shares with me. That's the right attitude right there. The first group says, I share with God when I want to. The second group says, kind of grudgingly, I share with God because I have to. And the third group says, it's all God's. And he takes 90% that I'm left with. 
and miraculously makes it go further than 100% ever could have gone on its own. Now, how many of you, can I get a witness today, will testify to the fact that tithing is a secret plan with God and shoes last longer and the roof is stronger and God blesses tithing? Can I hear an amen? amen? This is what it's all about. The attitude of obedience. So understanding that bit of introduction, that we are to return the tithe, what is the tithe? We just defined it. It's a definite proportion. That's number one. A definite proportion. 10%, a simple calculation. Just moving the decimal point. Somebody holler it out. What's your tithe if you make $100? $10, right? If you make $1,000, it is $100, right? Let's challenge you. You make $482. 48. 48. Round down. <laughs> 48.20. You're exactly right, sir. Um, <laughs> since the beginning of time, this has been God's method. God's people throughout history have maintained the practice of returning the tithe, the first 10%. And let me prove that, especially since there's some out there in our world today who says, reject any preaching about tithing because tithing is from the Old Testament law. You'll hear that. You'll hear people say tithing is Old Testament law. No, God put that in the heart of His people long before the law was ever given. Genesis 14 starting in verse 18, talks about Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. It says he blessed him. Uh, uh, he was the priest of the Most High God. Next slide. Uh, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. This was Abraham taking the spoils of war, all their increase, and giving it to the priest. That was Melchizedek, who's a type of Christ, by the way, for the continuation of God's work. So if you're writing this down in the bulletin, under Abraham, you write, commenced. Abraham commenced it. And of course, that was long before the law existed that we see in Scripture. Abraham commenced the tithe. Genesis 28 and verse 22 says, And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. This is Jacob, Abraham's grandson, continuing it. Jacob continued it. Abraham commenced it. Jacob continued it. Then the law came along. Moses came along and God gave him the law. And in Leviticus 27 and verse 30, it says, All the tithe of the land, whether it be the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. Concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Here Moses commanded it. Moses commanded it to the people. A few hundred years later, we come to our text and Malachi confirmed it. And we just read that. Malachi confirmed it. Then come to your New Testament. Just a few years later, Jesus commended it. Jesus commended it. And we'll show you now Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, justice, judgment, mercy, faith. Then he says, these ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other done. In other words, Jesus there says, sure you should tithe, but also you should do some other things. There are more important things, which we've said from the beginning. More important things for us to talk about all year. But tithing is not an excuse for unholy living either. And he was saying, just because you tithe doesn't get you off the hook. Uh, so... If you look this way, let's recap throughout this little walk we've taken through Scripture. Tithing. Abraham commenced it. Jacob continued it. Moses commanded it. Malachi confirmed it. Jesus commended it. Who are we to cancel it? Oh, I've got a different arrangement. Me and God have an understanding. No, God's Word is spoken, and we either obey what it says, or we don't. Besides, the New Testament always takes things to a higher level, right? Jesus came to 
fulfill the law, to take the law to greater heights. For instance, he said, you hate someone, I say you've killed them in your heart. You lust after someone, I say you've committed adultery. Get the real point of the matter here. And so the New Testament teaches giving above the tithe. He takes it st uh, further. So tithing's always been God's method. He's always used his people to do his work. And here we are in the New Testament church in the year 2021. And yes, right here, the water of life flows freely. But the plumbing costs money. That's right. We may have online church one week or be snowed out or have to cancel, but the bills still pour in, you know? You can't call up the companies and say, yeah, we didn't have church that week, so we don't owe that then, right? No, the church still owes it. So we still owe our tithe for that week too. By the way, somebody recently said, the church should get a stimulus too. We're getting a stimulus. The church should get a stimulus. Basically, we've answered the question right there. If we've received it, and we obey with the first fruits of all our increase. We tithe on our stimulus, and the church does get a stimulus. So, one last thing about this before we move to number two. The attitude toward giving, it really shouldn't be a duty. It really should be a delight, shouldn't it? 2 Corinthians 9, 7 is where it says, Let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, that's duty, for God loveth a, a cheerful giver. In the Greek, the word is hilarious. That just says, what a privilege to return to God this small portion and then to have Him as my partner making the 90% go so much further than 100% ever could on its own. That's the right motive for giving, is love. Love and obedience. Now, you've seen the bumper sticker uh, that says, honk if you love Jesus, right? I heard of one that says, tithe if you love Jesus. Any fool can honk. <laughs> really show it. Put, uh, put your money where your mouth is. You know, when you look at our world today, look at what happened even in Syria this week. Think about these radical Muslims who are so willing to give everything to their cause. I mean, they give everything they own, they give everything they are in their own life for the sake of evil. How much more should it break our heart to see some of God's people moan and groan to give for good to God? It's a delight, not a duty. Tithing's a privilege. And number one was that it's just this definite proportion. Number two, you bring it to a designated place. The designated place here is in our text. Malachi 3.10 calls it the storehouse. Uh, look at verse 10 with me, please. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the local New Testament church. That's where you're based. That's your home church. That's where you're fed, uh, whether you're a member or not. Your, your home base. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. What a promise given to the children of God by their father. Storehouse. In the Old Testament, that was the temple. Part of the temple was the storehouse. Remember, they were an agricultural society. When they harvested, they brought the first tenth of their wheat or their corn or whatever. They put it in the storehouse. When their herds gave birth, they took one out of every ten to the storehouse. And these things were used as a medium of exchange, like money. It also fed the priests. So if you catch a fish and want to give one to your preacher, that's okay too. Uh, I love them. They fed the priests with it. They used it for animal sacrifices, and they used it all like money. It was currency in those days. Here's the point. The tithe was brought to the place, the designated place, where the people worshipped. And today that's the local New Testament church. We've got no side arrangements with God. He's already told us where to take it. Some, again, say, I, the Lord's led me to go somewhere else. Well, His Word has led us. It tells us exactly where to take it in this passage, to the storehouse. So it's very simple. We all come together, God's people, on God's day, to study God's Word, and we ought to bring with us God's tithe. And we tithe where we're fed. We don't eat and run. You know you don't go to McDonald's 
and say, you know, I saw Burger King stock is down. I'm going to go pay them, but thank you for what you're giving me here. You don't, you don't eat and run. Uh, you don't dine and dash with God. You give to parachurch organizations? I hope so. I do. Over and above the tithe, because that's not the storehouse. But they're very good and worthy to give over and above the tithe. So, here's some good news for our church. God has promised to meet our needs here, regardless of whether you obey in the tithe or not. Uh, my salary has not changed one dime if you start tithing. It's not commission here. If you decide to tithe, all you can know for sure is that you'll be blessed. That's right here in our text. Notice the words, prove me. You see that in verse 10, where God says, prove me. It's an important phrase which means test me, put me to the test. Normally we're not supposed to tempt God, but in this case, he says it's an unconditional promise. Put me to this test. See if I will not bless you for it. God says, I will pass this test. So, shifting gears for a moment. If you come to the very end of your month, how many of you sometimes have too much month left at the end of the money, right? Sometimes there's too much month left at the end of the money. You get to the bottom of your budget and say, I can't pay these last things on the list because I'm out of money. A person who tithes last says, truthfully, I cannot tithe. But don't you be caught saying that because it reveals that you're tithing last rather than first. Proverbs 3.9 says it this way, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the, say it aloud with me church, first fruits of all thine increase. He's got to be at the top of the list. It's got to be our first uh, step in our budget. The first fruits of all thine increase. You say, well that was extra money that I received over here you know, from whoever, or government or whatever, all thine increase. It's pretty simple. So that kind of person looks at their budget and says, uh, I can't afford it because it's first. And God, the rest of this is up to you. Don't give God your leftovers. So um, I like the way verse 10 puts it when God says, see if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings. Because he's got a big window up there. He's got a lot of blessings up there. Uh, then he goes a step further in verse 11. And this might speak more to us today than anything. Verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. Saith the Lord of hosts. Rebuke the devourer. Again, agricultural people he's talking to. And they had enemies to their crops, whether it was flooding or drought or locusts or whatever. God says, put me first and I'll hold these devourers at bay, these things that can go wrong. Most of us aren't farmers, but we all have enemies to our finances. We have devourers of our finances. The Old Testament says, He that earneth money putteth it in, into a bag with holes. <laughs> you know? Money talks, doesn't it? Mine does. It says, bye-bye. <laughs> it's just gone so quickly. What are the devourers of our finances today? They're optional things that may or may not happen. Hospital bills. Car repairs. This fall, my daughter will be a, a senior. Anybody else ever suffered from maltuition? I have. I am right now still suffering from maltuition. But as I said, God makes shoes last longer and the roof stronger. He rebukes the devourer for his sake when we obey him. So here's the really bottom line question as we finish now. How will you fare with only 90% of your money, but God as your partner promising to bless you? Or, if you're going to keep it all 100%, how's that plan working for you? Some say, if God really blesses me, I'll tithe. No, that's putting the cart before the horse. Tithe, and then he says, I'll bless you. 
I'm not trying to put you into a straitjacket, folks. I'm trying to set you free. I know that there's a lot of people today with a lot of debt. I do some counseling about that sort of thing. Debt counseling. We can talk about financial freedom all day long if we want to, but as a believer, we'll never be free until we obey this. No Christian is allowed to skip the first step of financial obedience that God gives us. This passage teaches very loud and clear, when you tithe, there is always a blessing. And when you don't, there's always a curse. And there's never any exceptions to these things. Look at verse 8. Back in verse 8 now. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. You say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Verse 9. Ye are cursed with a curse. I love you, church. I don't want you under a curse. I don't want your finances cursed. That's verse 9. Number 3. This definite proportion brought to a designated place. It's all for a divine purpose. It's all truly for the glory of God. To get the gospel out. To be all about these other subjects that we want to talk about all year long and, and will no matter what. So most of our messages can be about the cross, be about the gospel, be about heaven and hell and being saved and, and holy living. One final story and we're done here. In Africa, there's a certain monkey. I love this. A certain monkey that's considered a delicacy. Hungry yet? Yeah, they eat this monkey in this part of Africa. And they have a proven method for capturing this kind of monkey. They build a little box, put a hole in the side of it, a small hole. They fill it with fruit and nuts. It's just big enough for the monkey to put his open hand in and grab stuff, but then his fist can't come back out. And he's trapped because he's so greedy, he won't let go. <laughs> they say the villagers can literally just walk right up to the monkey, and the monkey will keep trying, keep trying. He would rather commit monkey side <laughs> than let go of that food. There's undoubtedly people today listening to this by video or here in this room. You're committing financial suicide, not letting go of the tithe. It's a simple question today. Who's in charge of your money? Tell God He's in charge. Tell Him 100% of it's yours. Return the tenth to Him. It's a trust fund. Trust Him. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, if you've never been saved, I assure you that the only thing God wants from you is you. He wants your heart. It's not about the money for you. Trust Him as your personal Savior. He did die on the cross in your place. He did take your hell for you. He wants to give you His heaven. He wants to come into your heart and save your soul for you to be born again. That's the real trust fund. That's where it all starts. Christians, we know this. He gave everything for us. Will we give everything to Him? Lord, I pray this morning that You'd help us to walk in obedience in Your ways, to fulfill the needs here and around the world. I thank You, Lord, that You've enabled us as a church to do so well through these difficult 11 months to actually increase our uh, bank accounts by twenty or $30,000 during this time, Lord, that's all to Your glory. Unlike so many churches having to let their assistant pastors go, Lord, You've enabled us to go forward because of obedience. I thank You for that. We give You the glory for it. Lord, as we see the tide turning in our nation and in our churches, we want to follow Your formula. So these things don't happen to us. And Lord, I pray that someone would be saved and accept this gospel that we offer, the truth of salvation. And help us to live our lives for you 100%. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.